Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Understanding Health Disparities and Inequality presented by the Provost Cross-Cutting Initiative and in Inequality. This is our first masterclass, but one of many webinars given during the pandemic offering a platform from which NYU faculty, staff, and students doing innovative work related to inequality may lift their voices. We are grateful to the organizers. In particular, we are thankful to the leadership of C2, Sybil Raver, Alan Shaw, and Michael Lindsay. Dr. Umpad and I also send a heartfelt thank you to Ashley Gerhardt, Monique Francois, Kyle Romero, and Caroline Dorson from Myers College of Nursing. My name is Maya Clark Ataya. I'm an assistant professor in NYU Roy Myers College of Nursing. I will be your moderator for this evening. This evening, your master class will include a session with a master teacher from NYU. A group of students will participate in the live class as you observe. You will have the opportunity to ask questions throughout the class and at the completion of the lecture. Please enter your questions into the chat box. We will be monitoring and attempt to get to all questions in real time. This evening's master's class will focus on health disparities and in particular health disparities in COVID-19. To those of us that work in this space, it was no surprise that these disparities were identified. However, the overwhelming majority of the population was introduced to new words, new concepts, and a new reality. We are hoping that taking some time to learn how epidemiologists, public health experts, and clinical scientists critically read and examine journal articles to broaden our knowledge base will give you some guidance in terms of understanding what is currently going on in health disparities. It is my distinct honor to introduce you to Dr. Danielle Umpod. Dr. Umpod is an Associate Professor of Epidemiology and the Associate Dean for Education in the School of Global Public Health. Her areas of research are urban health, HIV, illicit drug use, and adult access to vaccines. Dr. Umpod is joined by current NYU students in various phases of their studies across several disciplines. And with that, let's begin. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us, both the, the people, uh, the students who are here with us live and those of you who are listening. We're so happy that you are here tonight. And so I am going to talk about uh, COVID disparities and we uh, provided a paper for people to read and hopefully I am um, with it enough to share the correct screen. I think this is the right one. Awesome, okay. So um, we're gonna be talking about differential impacts of COVID-19 on um, black communities in the United States. And this paper was written by uh, Millet and colleagues. But um, before we talk about the article, uh, I wanted to go over a few things just to help orient us to the paper. So um, we're gonna talk about health disparities and inequality generally, and then I'm gonna give kind of a, a, a quick introduction about how to read scientific articles. I know some of you read it um, before you came to the webinar. Some of you are gonna read it after, some of you might not read it at all and are gonna rely on our discussion to inform you, and that's cool too. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the article and we'll um, have some questions. Um, so this is gonna be very interactive with the students in the webinar and they know that they can interrupt me um, with any questions or comments. So first let's talk about health disparities and inequalities. Um, so as Dr. Uh, Clark Kutaya said, those of us in public health we're not surprised when we started to see COVID inequalities um, for COVID infections, for COVID hospitalizations, for COVID um, uh, deaths. And then, you know, we just got the vaccine in December and we already see COVID vaccine disparities. So none of this surprised people in public health. This was very predictable, but this might have caught um, other people who are not in public health um, off guard. So, I think it's helpful to think about what health is um, because we kind of take for granted that we all know what we're, that we're talking about the same thing. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is according to the World Health Organization in 1946 when it was set up. Later, they modified this, um, this definition to include um, also leading a socially and economically productive life. Right? So it's not just about whether you're sick or not, it's actually a holistic view of what health is. Now, what we do know is that some people are healthier than others. So empirically, 
uh, meaning we can look at data and we can evaluate who is healthy by comparing different kinds of health outcomes. Um, we can look at all cause mortality, which means just general death rates, regardless of why someone died. We can look at sp specific mortality rates. Um, so COVID specific mortality rates or HIV specific mortality rates or diabetes or heart disease specific mortality rates. We can look at more positive outcomes like five-year survival rates. So, you know, someone gets cancer, what proportion of people live for five years after their cancer diagnosis? We can also look for the presence or the absence of certain diseases. And these are just examples of different types of health outcomes. So when we compare health outcomes across different groups of people, one of the most consistent findings around the world is that some people are healthier than others. And what often happens is that one group of people is persistently healthy, healthier than others across a range of outcomes. And that some groups are less healthy than others across a range of um, outcomes. So health disparities, according to the National Institutes of Health, are the difference in incidence, which means new cases, prevalence, which means the number of cases of the disease, whether they're new or old cases, morbidity, which basically means illness or sickness, mortality, which is death, and the burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups. So inherent in looking at health disparities is that we're always comparing groups of people, right? The comparison is what's really important here. And so in the US and around the world, um, we do see major disparities in health. In the US, a lot of those disparities are observed for different racial and ethnic groups. So some racial and ethnic groups have um, higher burdens of certain diseases than others. We also see it by socioeconomic status. Generally, poor people have poorer health outcomes to, compared to more affluent people. Um, we also see disparities by gender, by immigration status, by sexual orientation, by other population characteristics. And there are a range of potential reasons for this health, these health disparities. Sometimes it could be biological, right? So it could be that certain groups are more likely to have a certain gene that may make them more likely to have a disease. So for example, sickle cell anemia, we tend to see that more in black populations and um, certain populations in the Mediterranean, right? Tay-Sachs disease, we tend to see in certain Jewish communities, right? And those are biologic determinants of health, but there are other determinants of health. Most of the disparities that we see are actually not related to biology. So when we think about health equity, we're thinking about health differences and inequalities that are unfair or unjust. And these we call inequities. So how do we judge unfairness? We can ask ourselves, are the inequalities due to biologic variation? That might, you might feel like that's unfair, but it's not something that changing the situation, like a, a political situation or a societal situation could change the incidence of that disease, right? because the variation is biological, but far more diseases are caused by different types of um, uh, variations, like variations in living conditions or variations in the laws that you live under or the way those laws are applied to you or people in certain groups. It could be differences due to informed individual choices, but I make the caveat here that Individual choices are made in the context of people's environments and lived experience. So what you think may be an individual choice is actually shaped by somebody's lived experience and whether or not they can make certain choices. Um, so basically your behavior doesn't happen in a vacuum and it's shaped by the environment, the social environment, the political environment, the physical environment that you live in. So one question we should ask ourselves, do the inequalities represent systematic and potentially remediable differences in one or more aspects of health across populations or population subgroups? So systematic, meaning that generally one group tends to have um, 
poor health outcomes or specific poor health outcomes compared to another, um, that this may be related to something about the systems in which we live, and that these um, differences could be potentially remediable if we make some changes. So, for example, um, if we look at uh, drug use outcomes and we look at overdose, um, we know that um, Black and Hispanic people are more likely to be incarcerated if they use drugs than white people, even though oftentimes white people are more likely to use certain drugs. Um, so that is a, a problem that has to do with the way laws are applied to certain populations. And why does uh, policing of drugs matter? Well, that has an impact on overdose because if you're worried about being arrested for possession of drugs, you may not call um, uh, ambulance or the police to help you if someone is overdosing, right? So that's just an example of how a policy could impact health. But if we change the way either what the policy was or the way the policy is enacted, we could actually reduce disparities. Okay, so I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about how to read scientific articles. But before I do that, are there any questions about health disparities? Can I ask a question? Of course. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, you talked about like different reasons why health disparities might exist, particularly in the United States, and that they exist in other countries too. Yes. Um, I don't know. Is like the design of a health system, for example, like in the UK, where healthcare is at the point of service for everyone. Can that, do you know if health disparities still exist in the same way in countries like that? So there are still health disparities in the UK and there's actually this report, um, I can't remember the name, maybe the black report or the green report. I, I feel like it's, it's a color, um, but it was written um, by Sir Michael Marmot that looked at um, healthcare or health disparities in the UK. And it really focused on what they call the, the gradient, which is the economic gradient. Um, but they did see even in the context of basically universal health care and the National Health Service, there are still health disparities. It's, and I think what that points to, Gavin, is this idea that it's not just that services are available, but it's how they're um, administered, who provides the services, what they're attitudes, knowledge, and beliefs are to the different patient populations that they work with, people's historical experiences with healthcare providers and whether or not they want to go. So even in places like the UK, the United Kingdom, where they have universal health care, they still have health disparities. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, thank you. And I wonder, you know, I guess a follow-up, maybe if there's time, yeah. <laughs> not to monopolize, but um, do these disparities kind of follow along lines of like race or ethnicity? And like, can we tease that out from things like socioeconomic status? Uh, so you mean in the UK or, or generally? I guess in general, but also like when I think in the US, people who don't have health insurance don't, you know, get health care kind of thing. And so, that's a disparity. But, you know, how is that different from race, and SES and things like that? There's this concept, um, intersectionality. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but the idea that our opportunities and our experiences are shaped by multitudes are, of our identity. And it's not necessarily how we identify, but how the world interacts with us because of our different identities, right? And so um, it, what is important in terms of health disparities is gonna change from country to country. Depend, I mean, quite frankly, it a lot of it has to do with oppression and discrimination and sis, uh, systemic either racism or uh, sexism or classism, whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, we even see a gradient if you look at, if you take, you know, race, ethnicity and socioeconomic status, right? You're, you will see often that um, Black and Hispanic people have poor health outcomes, but then among Black and Hispanic people, more affluent Black and Hispanic people have better health outcomes than those who are less affluent or who are poor. Um, so I don't, th it, sometimes it's hard to disentangle, um, you know, where most of the, the, the um, problem is. 
Um, but it is something that people do try to do. And in, in some cases you can, but they all kind of work together, right? It's, it can be very synergistic. Okay, so let's talk about reading scientific articles. So for those of you for whom reading a scientific article is a novel thing, um, I thought I would kind of give you the anatomy of a typical article. Um, the abstract generally summarizes the main points. And if it's a great abstract, it gives you the, the main finding and the implications. Um, you'll have an, so that's usually somewhere between 150 and 300 words. Um, and oftentimes, I'll be honest, some of us just read the abstract to figure out if we're going to read the whole paper. Um, then we have the introduction, which is going to summarize uh, previous research, tell us what the gaps in the previous research are, and then tell us what the aims of this paper are. Usually it's to fill one of those gaps in the previous literature. Then the methods is basically what they did, how they collected their data, how they analyzed that data. The results are what they found. And the discussion basically tries to contextualize those results to what else is going on in the world related to that topic um, so that we can understand the implications of what they found. So how do you read a scientific article? Well, the first thing I tend to do is read the abstract. Um, and I will read the abstract to figure out if I want to keep on reading. Um, and then uh, when I'm reading the paper, I'll generally read the paper once through. Uh, I make notes of things that I don't understand. Um, I also flip back and forth to remind myself what they did and how they did it. So sometimes I'll get to the results section and they'll have some kind of finding and then I'll flip back to the method section and be like, wait, how did they measure that? Or what kind of analysis did they do to get that result? Um, I generally look up the things that I don't understand. So Google is my friend. When I first started reading uh, research papers, there was no such thing as Google. So y'all got it a lot easier than I did because looking up things I didn't understand required me going to the library physically sometimes and using the index medicus, but now it's at your fingertips. And there are lots of um, different types of resources on the internet um, that can help you understand um, certain concepts or methods. Then I go back to the results and the discussion to understand kind of what the upshot is, what the major finding is. I will say this is not like reading a magazine article. So it's not like you're going to sit back, read it um, from the beginning to the end, and then you're done. In the beginning, when you start reading research articles, it may take a few hours or even a few reads to understand most of the paper. And my experience with some of my students is even if they're in public health, sometimes there's about anywhere is upwards of 25% of the paper that they don't really understand what's going on. And then they come and ask us questions, right? So if you don't get what's happening um, from the get-go, uh, you're in great company, right? So I wouldn't worry about that. Just keep trying and you'll, the more you read, the less you'll have to Google. Um, or you can get a master's in public health at NYU. We would love to have you. Okay, so um, the other thing to keep in mind is that you should read articles critically. Just because it's published, even if it's in a high impact journal, does not mean that it's a good paper. There's a lot of junk that gets published. Um, so, and then I will say your ability to evaluate the science and identify problems is gonna be a function of your experience and your expertise, right? So um, just be cautious and think critically about what's happening and take notes as you go. Hi, okay, Dr. yes. So uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, just because it's published, it may not be a good paper. What is considered like not a good paper? Sometimes it takes a bit of time for us to figure out a paper isn't good, right? So if you're, if you're trained to read these kind of papers, you're going to read the methods and you're going to say, oh, they didn't measure this very well, or this, the, their research approach doesn't fit the question they're trying to ask, or they interpreted something wrong, or they did something wrong. Um, and the lay public, they might not be able to discern that. And that's kind of what makes um, science reporting a little confusing for people, um, because sometimes there'll be a paper that makes a big splash, like that paper on um, measles and um, autism, 
uh, that was published in the Lancet years ago that contributed to distrust of vaccines. Um, that paper years later was retracted um, and the Lancet said that it was a flawed paper that some of the data had been falsified. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little challenging, I think, for people to figure out what's good and what's bad. Um, but you know, you can always ask me or possibly another epidemiologist. I don't wanna like make all my colleagues available, um, but um, there are lots of forums that discuss uh, science and articles. So there are, there are always people who are willing to talk to you about science. Okay, so let's talk about Millet et al, right? So um, things to look up in anticipation that you might, if, you're, um, if you haven't read it yet and you're getting ready to, you want to learn about what ecological analysis is, because that's what this paper is. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what that is. You want to learn about the concept of risk. And if you want to get really, really like down in the nitty gritty of the methods, you'll want to look up rate ratios, population attributable fractions, confounding, and zero inflated negative binomial regression, which is a very intimidating term for an analysis, a statistical analysis that basically estimates risk. So two concepts that I want to discuss with um, the group before we talk about the paper are um, ecologic analysis and risk. So an economic, ecologic analysis is when an analysis is based on clusters or groups and not on individuals. So this paper um, is analyzing data from counties, not from individuals. So what you don't want to be is a victim of ecologic fallacy. So ecologic fallacy means that you read this paper and then you say, based on this paper, Black people are more likely to have COVID, right? That's not what this paper says. This paper says that counties that have a higher proportion of Black people are more likely to have COVID cases. It's a subtle difference, but what you don't want to do um, with an ecologic analysis is take findings that are based on a group and apply them to individuals, right? Um, that doesn't mean that there's not an association at the individual level, but that's not what this paper is talking about. And so, um, you know, epidemiologists, we really like to stay in our lane in terms of language and in terms of what the results can and can't tell us. Um, so this is a case of when you're reading a paper that the county is what you're analyzing and not people, you don't want to talk about people being at increased risk because that's not what this paper is telling us. The other I, con, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Rombot. Um, So you kind of mentioned ecological fall fallacy. Is there, would you say the aim of most epi epidemiological studies are to I guess, get an answer for the larger population or are most papers kind of trying to, I guess, address a smaller group? It depends. It depends on the research question. So some papers, they want to estimate the burden of disease for the entire population, whether that's the world, um, whether that's a country or a city. Some papers are really interested in focusing on particular subgroups. They might want to focus only on um, Black people or Black women, and maybe they want to focus on cancer outcomes among Black women, right? And all of those approaches to research are valid because they're asking different questions um, to help us improve the health of people, right? Sometimes you might want to know what's going on at the population level, so you want to know how much money you need to set aside to deal with a particular issue. You may want to focus on particular populations because you already know from other analyses that they're more likely to have a disease and you want to understand why or figure out ways to make it so that they're not more likely to have the disease. So all of those are valid questions and valid approaches to um, conducting research. Okay. Let me go over risk real quickly and that's the last kind of thing I'll talk about in general. So risk is the probability of an event in a defined population over a specific period of time. So what that means is like, maybe you've seen this on TV, like on CNN, when they tell you that there are 
X number of cases per 100,000 population in the United States of COVID. I don't know what it is now, but let's maybe say it's 20 cases per 100,000 people. That's an estimate of risk, right? That's, that's saying that um, for every 100,000 people, you would expect 20 people to have COVID. That's not the real number, because I don't remember what it is, but you kind of get the, the gist. Now, when we do health disparities research, we're often making comparisons to explain risk, right? And so the comparison becomes important. How can you tell if somebody, if um, a group of people are more likely to have the disease or not if you're not making a comparison? So we might, in this paper, we're looking, um, we're looking at counties. So we could be saying one county is X times as likely to have a COVID case as compared to another county. So you know, I, I am more familiar with Maryland counties than I am with New York counties. So maybe Prince George's County in Maryland is more likely to have a COVID case as compared to um, Charles County. Um, we could also say, and that's what this paper is saying, counties with a particular feature are X times as likely to have a COVID case as compared to counties without that feature. Right, and that's how we figure out that there are differences. Those differences don't necessarily, we don't necessarily know if those differences are unfair or unjust, um, but we can do research to, to figure that out or we can know enough about the situation to know that that is unfair or unjust. Okay, any questions? Okay, so our essential discussion questions for this paper is what is the problem? What did they do? What did they find? What do the findings mean? So this paper um, is looking at um, differential impacts of COVID-19 on black communities. So they acknowledge upfront that there's incomplete data reporting by race. So basically what this means is that if you filled out the census, the census and didn't put your race, then um, that's an incomplete report. And if enough people do that, that means that we don't know what proportion of the population is of a particular race. This can also happen when we're reporting COVID cases. So when COVID cases get reported, um, often they're reported with um, patient demographics. So they'll say, how old is the patient? What is their gender? Although they do tend to report sex sometimes rather than gender. They may say what zip code you live in, and they may say what race or, race or ethnicity you are. Now, they may not know your race or ethnicity, and so they may not put it, or they may not be systematically asking, or they may have asked and you didn't tell them your race, which you can do. Um, but by not having that racial data, it makes it challenging to look to see if there are COVID disparities. So one solution that they came up with was to do an ecologic analysis and to look at counties by what proportion of the county population is black. And so they have two categories. They have counties um, where the population is greater than or equal to 13% black. And then they have all the other counties which have less than 13% um, black residents. And they basically calculated risk ratios comparing the black counties to the, the, the counties with a higher proportion of black people to the counties with a lower proportion of black people um, based on the number of cases in all the counties, right? So they're looking at case counts. And the upshot is that they found that counties with higher proportions of black residents had more COVID-19 diagnoses and they had a rate ratio, which is basically comparing risk, right, of 1.24, which means that counties um, with a higher proportion of black residents were 24, had a 24% increased risk of having a COVID case as compared to counties with fewer, uh, a lower uh, proportion of black residents in their county. Um, and they, were, they had more COVID deaths significantly more COVID deaths. Um, so what they're saying is that um, nearly 20% of US counties have greater than, um, greater than or equal to 13% um, black residents. 
And those counties account for 52% of COVID diagnoses and 58% of COVID deaths nationally. So what they're arguing is that black communities have a higher burden of COVID-19 infections and deaths. That's kind of the upshot. So um, what are your questions or what are your thoughts team? And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna get rid of my slides and I'll only bring them up if we wanna talk about specific tables or, or, or uh, figures. Um, yeah, one uh, question I have is when looking at the uh, second page of the article, it talks about how 78% of the COVID-19 census data reported by state health uh, does not include race. So um, as you said, that was due to, you know, just incomplete reporting, but was is there institutional problems itself on the reporting? And is that a larger problem that needs to be addressed as well? But I'm also wondering if we did have all that data, could we make a better conclusion based on that, based on individuals rather than based on how this article evaluated it, which was by populations? That's a great set of questions, Jacob. Thank you. Um, so what it says for those of you who haven't read the article is that although the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention report cumulative COVID data um, to the state uh, that are reported by state health departments, 78% of the COVID-19 case reports were missing race and ethnicity um, disaggregations. So what's getting reported to the CDC um, doesn't have, um, doesn't all have uh, race and ethnicity data. So that's the reason for that is a variety of reasons. It could be state policy that they don't report back uh, race or ethnicity. It could be that the reports coming, so the report, the way reporting typically happens is that hospitals report to the state health department and then the state health department um, or the local health department reports to the CDC. It could be that um, the hospitals are not reporting race ethnicity. It could be not being systematically collected in their electronic medical record. It could be that patients come in and they are um, too ill to answer questions about race or ethnicity, right? So, and we need to be very careful about putting people in a race or ethnic group just by looking at them, right? Because, you know, people make mistakes all the time um, trying to attribute somebody's race or ethnicity to them just by their features. Um, I, I do this exercise with my student when I teach this class on social determinants of health where I ask them to tell me my race or ethnicity. And nobody, only one person has ever gotten it right. And they haven't, got, they haven't gotten it right by the way I look, they've gotten it right because they've listened to what I've said about my background. Um, and so you wouldn't know, you might think that I'm only white, but actually I am two other uh, races and ethnicities, but you wouldn't know that by looking at me. Um, one of my colleagues calls me white passing. Um, and so it could be that physicians just don't, have a, the ability to collect that from their patient. Patients could refuse. Um, it's not systematically in the electronic re medical record or it's not being systematically reported to um, the health departments or the CDC. Um, if we had more data, yes, of course, we could come up with a, with a better understanding of what's going on. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily a better conclusion because we, we will pro better conclusion to me is like there are no health disparities, right? Because that's what we don't want. We don't want, first of all, we don't want anybody to have COVID, but if people are going to have COVID, we don't want one group to be more likely to have COVID than the other, right? Um, but we could make um, more evidence-based conclusions um, and, and the, the data would be stronger to help us build our our case for how we might want to intervene with people. Other thoughts or questions? I yeah. see Ray raising yeah. your hand. Yeah, yep, that's right. Um, so I have a comment slash question. Sure. So like in my mind, when I think about health disparity research, it doesn't necessarily equate to like health equity research, not all the time because I feel like it's not enough to just say these groups are different or even at the county level, like the, this county is different because of these traits. And one of the things I thought about in this particular article was that like, even if it is at the county level, they still look at 
variables like uninsured versus insured, which to me is like they're making that assumption of like the proportionality of black people in one county is associated with the proportionality of uninsured versus insured in one county. So what so my question is like what would make this article more about health equity? Because in my mind it's like, so then why didn't they look at like quality of healthcare within a county? of like the hospitals in that county, because that's more like the responsibility of the county, I feel like. Um, so I guess, yeah, I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about like what makes health disparity research, health equity research in relation to this article. So that's a great question. So I will say that health disparity research is kind of a continuum, right? So it goes from pointing out that there are differences to coming up with understandings of why those differences exist, to designing interventions um, to make it so there are, the disparities are reduced. And interventions, I, I tend to not be enthusiastic about health disparities interventions that inter, intervene on the individual level, because as we know, a lot of the disparities are because of the system that we live in and the way our laws and society are set up, right? So why should I, if there's a group that is experiencing a disparity, why, why do I have, what do I fix about them, right? Because it, it's, the problem doesn't lie with the, their experiences. The problem lies with what, what, you know, our laws or the way we deliver healthcare um, is doing to them, a lot of it. So that's one thing. I think um, to your point about why they only looked at this, it could be that there's not good data available at the county level for healthcare quality, right? So they're basically using census data. That's kind of their data set. They haven't kind of combined other sources, a lot of other sources of data to look for more explanatory variables about why this is happening. Um, and so, with census data, I can't tell you, um, at least the type of data I think that they're using, I can't tell you how many of, or what proportion of black people also are uninsured in that county necessarily. Um, so that's probably why it, it's, um, it's done like this. Um, and I think your, your comment also brings up a good point. People tend to walk away with when you look at these county kind of level things is, and this is an ecologic fallacy, right? Is that if there are, if black counties are associated with um, more disease, uh, more, uh, uh, more poverty, you know, whatever. So that means that a black person in that county is poor, but that's actually not true, right? It could be that there's actually quite a bit of variation in the socioeconomic status of black people in that county. And to be clear, we know that there's a lot of socio, uh, variation in socioeconomic status among black people. And so we can't treat different ethnic and racial groups as a monolith, right? They're not just one thing. Um, we do know that it often happens that there are counties that have certain racial and ethnic makeup um, have other birds on top of them. And there could very well be a, a substantial proportion of people who are black and poor and uninsured in that county. But why is that? Probably due to the way our society has been set up, right? If you go back to urban renewal, um, that was a policy of the US government in the 60s and 70s, they would basically raise whole communities to put in like the highway. I think they did that with the major vegan, right? So they broke up communities, moved people around, um, ended up um, uh, breaking apart really vibrant communities. And it tended to be either poor or black um, communities that, that were disrupted in the, in the um, efforts for urban renewal because they had the least amount of political capital. And so white communities would be like, you're not doing that to our neighborhood. Um, and they were able to stand up to that, right? So to answer your question, it's probably a function of the data that they have available to them um, and not being able to identify necessarily uh, healthcare quality at the county level or other variables at the county level. Thank you. But I will say these types of analyses are helpful because if you were to look at a map of these counties, 
right, or identify the counties where there's high burdens, you know, that will tell policymakers where they could put their money, right? So even though this paper isn't necessarily offering solutions like how to fix this, you know, we know that those counties that have that high burden of COVID and are um, have more uh, black population probably need more investment, right? And so we can pay more attention to them and think about how we could best serve those communities. Dr. Umpod, we have I a have couple a... of questions from the audience about um, race as a, as a structure. Yeah. Wanting to know, you know, how we use race and ethnicity and how, what the relationship is with uh, socioeconomic status and how we interpret results, um, keeping those two in mind? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, when I read papers and I see that there are differences by race and ethnicity, I don't always think that black people are, you know, have poor health outcomes, um, because they're black, like something uh, physically or you know psychologically about being black, I tend to think about what is it about how we've set up society to create these disparities, right? And so I would be very careful when you see papers that say you know black people have these behaviors and that's why they're sicker, without the second clause of that sentence that says these behaviors may have arisen from you know, opportunities in their neighborhood. So, so for example, if you see differences that have to do with, um, with housing quality, right? We know that there, um, there was a policy um, in the US about redlining where um, in certain communities, black people weren't able to get a loan to buy a home there. They wouldn't allow them to. The former president actually um, engaged in, um, uh, discrimination in housing and wouldn't let um, black people move into their buildings to rent apartments, right? And so that meant that people got pushed into sometimes substandard housing, not because they couldn't afford it, but because they weren't allowed to buy it, right? And so if that happened in your family, right, there's this idea of like intergenerational um, uh, exposure to being placed in these communities. Um, where you were concentrated in, with poor quality housing. Um, and so that can have an impact on health. Um, so there may be things where it actually has to do with, um, you know, black people maybe having like some genetic marker more than others, but genetics actually count for a very small proportion of disease variation. Most of it actually has to do with behavior, with exposures um, and exposures, meaning what's happening in your community, um, what's happening at the political level, um, how laws are applied to your community. Um, so I would be very careful to about making conclusions um, without kind of understanding that all of our behaviors happen in the context of our lives. So for example, I used to live in East Harlem. I just moved um, to the West Village. And when I first moved to East Harlem, like the closest grocery store to me was a bodega and they didn't have a lot of like fresh fruits and vegetables. And then there was kind of a, there was another grocery store and they had fresh fruits and vegetables, but not a large variety. And sometimes they were just on the verge of going bad, right? And then as um, East Harlem began to gentrify, the produce got a lot better, right? And so what is that a function of? That's not a function of people in East Harlem not wanting to buy good quality fruits and vegetables, right? It's a couple things. Fruits and vegetables are really expensive um, and uh, companies decide what they're gonna sell based on what they think is gonna come off the shelves. Um, and sometimes they try to get away with uh, providing um, poor quality goods in either poor neighborhoods or uh, more diverse neighborhoods. Um, so it's not that people in East Harlem don't want to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but sometimes they're priced out of fresh fruits and vegetables or the quality of fresh fruits and vegetables that they have is not great. Um, and then there are other, you know, historical reasons based on, you know, um, deprivation, um, kind of uh, shaping the, the types of foods that uh, are served to our families. And then those foods become a part of our history. 
um, and we tend to eat them even though they're, they might not be the best for us, right? So I'm part Filipino. A lot of the stuff that, that I really like are things that I shouldn't be eating, but you know, historically that's what they eat. So Dr. Ompa, it seems as though like racial disparities is pretty intentional. So if it's intentional, how do we really close the gap? That is such um, a profound statement, Kiwanda. Um, and I think um, we've seen a lot of people, um, I've seen a lot of memes on like Instagram and face, I mean, I'm old, so I'm on Facebook too, and Twitter, um, where it says that the system isn't broken, it's working the way it was designed to. And I think that's what you're really tapping into. Um, and so how, if, if the, if the situation is intentional, if we're here because this is what it was designed to do, um, then what do we do about it? Well, I have to say uh, movements like Black Lives Matter is a really um, strong voice to bringing light to these types of structures that uh, create these disparities. Um, Black Lives Matter obviously tends to focus on policing in communities and policing doesn't really seem like it would be a public health issue, but when people are dying because of policing, that's a public health issue, right? Um, so I also think that um, there are some um, politicians who are really focused on equity um, and focused on, you know, increasing the, the uh, minimum wage, um, pushing for a living wage. Um, I think uh, one of the mayoral candidates wants to give people money. I forget what he calls his program. Um, but um, so sometimes you can throw money at the problem and that will fix it. But sometimes you can't throw money at the problem. And so you have to change the way we interact with people. Um, I think that uh, training um, healthcare providers uh, to be aware of their own biases and to work to overcome them so that they don't provide substandard care um, for different communities is really important. And this kind of, that kind of cuts across all sorts of what we call social determinants of health, right? So you can, there's research to show that, you know, give me two people, one who's black and one who's white, they're both in pain, they're both saying that the same pain level, but the white person is more likely to get pain medication than the black person, right? Um, because there is this historical thought um, that black people don't experience pain. I don't know why, that doesn't really make sense to me, but that was a myth that happened. Or that, um, you know, there's, we know that there are um, disparities in maternal and child health, and especially maternal mortality. And in the United States, um, black women are more likely to um, experience maternal mortality than white women. Um, and some people have said that could be because of differences in rates of obesity, but actually there's growing evidence to suggest it's because black women are not being treated um, the same when they are um, pregnant, pregnant and during labor and delivery. Um, and so there have been a few cases um, that have hit the headlines of like women who have said that they don't feel well, they haven't been listened to, and then they died from uh, uh, eclampsia. So it's how care is delivered. Um, it's, it's people kind of not understanding that we all have biases. Um, and while you may have biases, that doesn't mean that you have to provide care that reflects those biases. You can, you can still do better. Right, um, and 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 it happens not just with the with the physician or the nurse, but it can also happen with the hospital administrator. Assumptions that people make about who you are and what you can afford or what you need based on what you look like. Um, you know, telling somebody who is obese and has type two diabetes that they need to join a gym and you know get on Nutrisystem. Well, if they're economically disadvantaged, they can't afford a gym membership and Nutrisystem is expensive, right? So that's not like a reasonable um, suggestion for somebody who might not be able to afford that. So it's, you know, making sure that our providers kind of understand the context in, what we, in which we live and shaping their um, treatment of us based on 
what is possible in our lives, and then maybe trying to find resources for us to have those things that you're suggesting. There's, there's kind of a movement that we're starting to see uh, with physicians um, uh, prescribing fruits and vegetables, right? And that being tied to access to green markets um, and vouchers that people can use in green markets. Um, so, so there are lots of ways to kind of address this, um, but it does take political commitment and we probably need to disrupt some people and people are gonna be uncomfortable. You should get, if you're gonna be in public health, you should get used to being uncomfortable and people are gonna call you on um, your biases all the time. And we have to be able to take that critique, um, take a look at it, look in the mirror and see what we're doing that is not supporting the health of everybody and making sure that disparities disappear, you know, and, and, and try to be better. That, uh kind of leads into my question, Dr. O. It seems pretty clear that in order to combat disparities, we need to be breaking things apart and reimagining them at the upstream policy level. But I was surprised in the article, they said that only 0.1% of disparity interventions were policy related. So 99.9% .9 of the disparity work that's being done isn't being done at that upstream policy level. So I'm wondering where the breakdown is. Like, is there not enough research? Are policymakers not value aligned? Uh, like what if, yeah, if we know that that's what we need, why is the lion's share of our efforts not being directed at policy? Um, I don't know that it's the lion's share of the efforts aren't being directed at policy as much as policies can be really hard to change. So just think about what happened when we tried to get Obamacare, right? So Obamacare, you know, it happened, but um, it was a very much a watered down version as President Biden said this week, it wasn't exactly what they envisioned, what they wanted. They wanted more, but they couldn't get more passed. And how many times um, did the Republicans try to repeal Obamacare, right? So policy change sometimes can be really easy. It can happen like if there's a if it if there is political will to make it happen, it can happen very quickly. But sometimes there's not political will. The Rockefeller drug laws. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I I study drugs a lot. The Rockefeller drug laws in New York were the ones that were three strikes and you're out. So you could be arrested for marijuana possession three times and the third time you could get an astronomical sentence, right? That doesn't really fit the crime. Um, and that tended to um, incarcerate more um, black and Hispanic, um, particularly men, and it resulted in mass incarceration. It took decades to get those repealed, decades. Um, and so my personal opinion is um, for a long time, um, White people have been in charge of policy um, that has changed slowly and not all white people uh, want to change the status quo. And so it, it really takes a lot of work, um, both advocating your position, but also like calling people out. And I think we've seen a lot of that um, more recently of people calling people out, but we, we have to think about how best to call people out, right? Um, and how best to get a coalition of people together to change the policies, right? So sometimes that's like embarrassing people, um, but that often doesn't work as we saw, they just double down. So sometimes we have to come at them with an economic argument. You know, most people don't wanna spend money. So if we can show you that you're gonna save money by doing this, um, sometimes that's convincing. Um, but it's really hard. It can be very hard to change policies, particularly big policies that are embedded in our daily lives. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, just one thing that I wanted to like ask, like a sort of a, a very much follow up to the, what you said, um, like, you know, how you talked about historical perspectives can play a large part. And unfortunately, uh, but understandably, there are many fears in communities like the Black community with regards to how doctors have dealt with pandemics in the past. Like, just one thing that comes to mind is with the Tuskegee syphilis study where they purposely injected uh, syphilis into members of the African-American community in That's Alabama. Oh wait, 
because that, oh, they I'm didn't sorry. inject them with syphilis. Oh, sorry, they did, sorry. Uh, with the Tuskegee syphilis. Now, what they did was messed up, mm. but that's not what they did. So, oh, what the, the Tuskegee study is basically they recruited um, black men in Tuskegee, Alabama, for a, a, a follow a, a prospective study where they followed people up over time, and they fought they recruited people who had syphilis. And then when syphilis treatments became available, like when penicillin became available, they systematically tried to prevent them from being treated for syphilis. Um, so they didn't inject them with syphilis. There is a study where people did get injected with syphilis, and that was a study that was done in Guatemala. But Tuskegee, they, they weren't experimenting on people, but they were um, trying to prevent them from getting treated. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, no, that's okay. I just want to clarify because yeah. people get that's the narrative, and I just want to clarify the narrative. Okay, but so like one thing that even if we do make policy change, how do we like gain the trust for people to actually want to like pursue the, those uh, you know uh, facilities or things? Because like since there has been so much uh, mis mis like a lot of mistreatment, it's very easy that people don't want to trust uh, systems. Yeah, basically every time a researcher does something messed up to somebody, they make it harder for everybody else. Um, and so I think the first thing we need to do is do better, right? We need to stop doing really, I'm not going to swear because this is being recorded, but you know what I want to say. We need to stop doing messed up things to people, particularly people who have historically been oppressed, um, but you know, anybody. The other thing we need to do is we need to have more um, people from affected communities as a part of the healthcare provider um, cadre, right? So we need more black people, we need more Hispanic people, we need more indigenous people to be researchers, right? Because first of all, they have a lived experience that I could never have that may provide different insights into the experiences of communities that are experiencing the disparities, right? Um, and I don't mean in a token way. I mean, I, we, need, we need leaders and we need to support people to become leaders in public health and science and research um, so that those voices are heard and those experiences are brought to bear. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I also think that those of us who are not in those communities need to do a lot of work to figure out what we're doing wrong, either us as individuals or collectively in our groups, um, what, are doing, what we're doing wrong and pointing out when that's happening and not letting it continue, right? So, um, you know, I, I think Jacob, you bring up a really good point and something that I've been thinking about lately. Um, instead of trying to convince people that the vaccine is safe, we need to think about what we've done wrong to make people feel that the vaccine is not safe. Um, we need to figure out what we did wrong to make people not wanna come to the hospital, um, to make people not want to wear a mask or socially distance. I mean, I, those are a little bit different and, you know, we're all tired of wearing masks and staying away. And, you know, I would like to go have a cocktail or go out to dinner. Um, but, you know, I'm waiting to get vaccinated for enough people to get vaccinated so that I don't run the risk of either getting COVID or giving COVID to somebody. But what have we done wrong um, as healthcare providers, as researchers, as a society to make people feel this level of distrust? And what are we going to do to fix that? Rather than trying to say that, you know, your beliefs are wrong, you know, some of those beliefs are, uh, some of those concerns are rational and they're based on either personal experience with healthcare providers or family's experience with healthcare providers or our community's experience um, with researchers and healthcare providers. Um, so sometimes I think we're intervening with the wrong groups. Any other thoughts or questions? I have a question. Um, so it seems that the understanding of social determinants of health, um, especially on certain minority communities, is really well known and widely discussed throughout public health and the other social sciences and academia more broadly. But do you feel like the broader population also like has a sense of these disparities, or you know, is that just 
is there some disconnect in communication about this and what do you think we should do about that? That's a great question. Um, so among my friends, I'm a broken record. So they, they all know, like I have friends who don't do public health at all. Um, and I'm sure they're tired of my posts about public health and um, sometimes about health disparities. Uh, I do think that there hasn't really been a national conversation outside of science and healthcare about uh, health disparities in the way that, um, you know, my mom has only heard about it because I talk about it, not because um, she saw it on TV prior to COVID. But I think COVID has brought it into sharp focus um, because I think people were surprised that Within a year of having this new disease, we already had entrenched health disparities. And I feel like some people got whiplash. They're like, how did that happen so fast? Um, whereas those of us kind of in the know were, were saying that this was gonna happen. You know, um, we're saying that, you know, once you saw disparities in COVID infections, you could predict that there were gonna be disparities in mortality, hospitalization and in vaccine access. Um, and we've kind of seen um, both at structurally how the vaccine has rolled out, right, has probably caused disparities, but also there are, there are individuals who um, have resources, opportunities, and privileges that some people don't have, and they'll go out of their way to get a vaccine um, that somebody living in a poor community would never have the opportunity to go get that and break the rules, right? Um, so, you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, this was kind of inevitable given the state of our world, um, but it shouldn't be, right? It shouldn't have been inevitable. Alessandro, I saw that you were going to take off your mic and say something. Yeah, so I had a question. Um... When I was reading the article, they discussed, uh, the researchers kind of discussed the, I guess, the idea of confounding in particular with Black people in urban centers and kind of the urban centers being affected more by COVID-19 during the first wave. And I was wondering, I guess, with confounding as a whole, do you think that researchers, um, when they're doing epidemiological studies, do they aim to, to do studies in areas that lack confounding or would it maybe be ta considered tampering? to try to aim for a study without confounding? How, how exactly does that work? Okay, well, first, I think we better define confounding um, for some people who may know what it is, may not know what it is. So um, in real brief terms, confounding means that you observe an association between some exposure and some outcome or some variable and an outcome, right? So maybe um, you see that, um, I don't know, people with diabetes are more likely to get COVID, but if you don't take into account obesity, you may um, overestimate or underestimate the risk of COVID for somebody with diabetes, right? So con a confounder is a variable that kind of confuses the relationship between a variable and an outcome, right? And so Alessandro, to answer your question, all epidemiologists want to control for all confounding so we can get the absolute precise um, association between an outcome and an exposure. But no study is perfect. You can't measure all confounders and you don't always measure them well. So there's always going to be some confounding in your study. Um, the question is, can you control for it? And um, oftentimes that's yes, but sometimes that's no. And then we just have to be very careful with how we interpret our findings which for those of you who are not epidemiologists, that means that sometimes we sound real wishy-washy when, when we get on TV or in the newspaper and we say, you know, this is associated with this. You'll very rarely hear an epidemiologist say cause or prove, right? Y'all use that co colloquially, um, but epidemiologists only use that under circum certain circumstances with enough evidence to say that this is actually a, an association that is cause and effect. But it takes a lot of research to get to that point. Um, so it was a little bit of a technical response. I hope I didn't like lose anybody. We have time for one more question. Um, there's a question from the audience. 
uh, Danny says, in my opinion, a driving factor of health disparities in our country is due to capitalism, e.g. motivations of healthcare being centered around profits. Can you speak to your thoughts on the role of capitalism and health disparities? Additionally, I do not see many scholarly articles that focus on capitalism as the crux of disparities in our country. Why is it that academia shies away from the condemning capitalism and profit motivations regarding the health of people? That is such a great uh, question and a provocative question. So I will say that um, I don't know much about capitalism um, as a determinant of health. Um, because it's not something that I study. I'm not really trained in political science and I haven't really been trained to think about how to measure capitalism. That being said, um, you know, there are, there are papers that have looked at um, uh, the impact of for-profit or, um, you know, Medicaid billing, um, on health outcomes. There's actually a really interesting article that was in the New Yorker years ago um, by Atul Gawande. Um, and it was looking at um, healthcare, uh, health outcomes in, I think it was El Paso compared to, oh, what was the other city? I forget what the other city was, but basically, um, in one city, the hospitals wanted to charge Medicaid for everything, and so there, or charge insurance for everything, and it was really expensive. And they did like a lot of testing, um, um, so they spent a lot per capita on healthcare. But their health outcomes weren't any better than the city that uh, didn't do all that extra testing. Um, and so there are papers like that, but capitalism as a whole. I think you might find more of that literature maybe in sociology or in political science rather than in public health. I think part of it is um, in epidemiology, we want to know how to measure it, right? So um, you may see some ecologic studies looking at maybe countries that, with different levels of capitalism and those and health healthcare outcomes by that, um, but it's just not an area that I'm familiar with. Um, but you're right, you know, people making decisions on whether or not you get health care or what kind of health care you get based on profit is problematic um, and probably contributes to disparities. I'm sorry if that was an un uh, unsatisfying answer. All right, Dr. Rampad, any final comments? Any final comments, Dr. Umpod? Um, I hope you guys um, start to read some of the literature, not just the newspaper articles, um, because newspaper articles kind of cherry pick findings, um, but you can actually learn a lot from um, some of these articles and you don't necessarily have to be an epidemiologist or a biostatistician to be able to read these. Um, a lot of times the abstracts are very accessible um, and they kind of break down what's, what's happening. Um, but, you know, we live in a country with entrenched um, health disparities. So I hope that some of you will think about um, how you can have an impact on reducing these disparities, either from the way you interact with people in your life or getting a master's in public health or a, a bachelor's in public health or a PhD in a public health discipline, come to the dark side. We're always looking for, um, you don't have to have a math background to study public health. Some of my best friends in public health were accountants first. Um, some of them were, worked in art. They were, they were not like, you know, somebody who you would think would get um, a, a, a PhD in epi. Um, they have varied backgrounds and we embrace that because we need all those perspectives because we're dealing with people's lives and people's lives are more than their health outcomes, right? Um, and so all that type of experience is really helpful in thinking through these problems. All right, my thanks to Dr. Ampad, our, our students and the Provost Cross-Cutting Initiative and in Inequality. Um, the takeaway here is that an individual's or given population's behavior and outcome is not entirely dependent upon their actions and their decisions. And as Dr. Ampad explained, we're products of our environment and of our circumstances. The reality is unfortunately that demonstrated um, by COVID, there's an unequal distribution of care and resources, for example, 
which often res results in adverse outcomes. Many of us have been shocked and disappointed in the lack of progress made in the past six months. COVID disparities continue to persist and have been seen in vaccination distribution and now in vaccination rates. So what does this mean for each of us? We hope that we've given you a rudimentary understanding of health disparities, but we also hope that our discussion and time together this evening encourages you to meet people where they are and to advocate for us to do better and expect more to affect change. Thank you for your time and attention this evening. We hope to see you all in future events. Thank you guys for coming. Um, the students, you guys were awesome. Um, I know that some of you, this is not your area of expertise, but I think you guys did a great job um, engaging with uh, the research and the subjects. Um, you guys were amazing. Um, so I hope you learned something new. And for our audience, thank you so much for spending this time with us um, in the evening. Um, you know, uh, you should stay tuned for more of these because I think they're gonna be really great. And thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Clark Kutaya and all the organizers for making it so easy for us to participate. Just a note that the recording is going to be available on uh, the YouTube channel. All right, everyone, have a good night.